Hi, everyone. Um, it's such a privilege to be here uh, at Asian Hustle Network. It's especially a privilege to see so many of our favorite brands uh, and companies. Shout out to Beacons. Uh, don't use Linktree. It sucks. Um, uh, I still use Linktree, but that's because I'm too lazy to move. Um, Anyway, hi for a hi. Uh, there's so many incredible people here. All right, uh, I was told to make this somewhat conversational and not dictatorial. So if y'all are okay with it, I'm gonna be more casual than usual. Is that okay? Okay, all right. So uh, I also, um, for a few of my friends and aunts, you know, I hate like inspirational anecdotal stories because it's just a waste of time in my mind. So I'm trying my best to give you all practical skills that I wish I knew when I was 25. Is that okay? Okay, and if you hate that, then we'll have like 15 minutes at the end to, to do other stuff. All right, so let's begin. Um, forgive my corny ass slides, by the way. I made these myself because I couldn't make my EA do it. Um, so, uh, so if they look like they suck, that's because they do. Um, so um, there are several things and failures I've had over the last decade or so of my like, career or professional career that I wish I knew when I was younger, and I hope you do not make the same mistake. Uh, I think we all know that everything has to begin and end with purpose. Uh, everyone says they want their purpose and so forth, but very few have found it. Uh, fast forward, there are a lot of sociologists and nurses that will indicate that the number one regret for people when they're dying is that they were not courageous enough to live the life that they thought they deserved. But what is omitted from that fear is most people don't even know why they are here. So how can you be afraid of something that you don't even understand? And so the first step to all things that I wish all of us knew when we were younger is why are we actually here and who do we actually want to be? There are a lot of ways to think about this. My favorite is this exercise called the meaning of life exercise where you basically define the end state of who you are in the last 20 years. The way that we manifest this at Gold House is the first question we ask all of our interviewees is what is the dream for you? If, and most people are sort of taken aback because they've never been asked this or they haven't been able to think about it. The way that we position it is, if I gave you $10 billion in every Rolodex imaginable, where if you called any number, the answer is yes on the other side, what would you build and why? And so that everything sort of has to begin with purpose um, is number one. Um, the, how does a clicker work? The second thing that is hilarious, oh, no, no, there we go. Um, the second thing that's hilarious is, who thinks they know what we all want in life? Or who thinks, first of all, who thinks they have their own purpose? Wow, there's a lot of hustle and not a lot of purpose in here. <laughs> Dear Lord. Well, so that's okay. Sometimes you have to ready fire aim and that's okay to live life. Uh, how many of you know what all humans want? The three things, what are they? Food, water, sh honestly, that's fair. Uh, Maslow smiles on you. Money, wow, okay, Asians also smile on you. Um, so, so money is actually one of them. So impact, uh, which is hopefully concentric with career, is one of them. We all want a meaningful impact or career. They just manifest in different ways. For some of you, you're a trust fund baby, and that is your version of wealth. God bless you. For some of you, you actually have to hustle and work. What are the other two? Community, familial relationships, as we all know, is actually the greatest definement of a successful and meaningful life. What's the third? I'm impressed you already got two of them. Most people don't get any of these. What's, legacy could arguably, it, legacy is right, it's arguably part of impact, at least in my framework. Uh, what's the third? It's health, thank you. you, if, you if you die, you can't do anything. Um, and so health, relationships, and impact are the top three most important things that everyone wants. Again, they just manifest in different ways. And what's interesting is while we're all trying to search for our purpose and think that we're all different, we actually all, again, want the same things. And so the way that you see this sort of emerge within the work life is often conflict will arise despite us wanting the same things, because of something called communication. Uh, majority of problems that arise, even though we all want the same thing in the end, come from the fact that we're not actually speaking the same metaphorical language. And so two of the things that I wish I learned when I was younger were, one, whenever there's conflict, to actually ignore the solution and reinvite the problem. Because often we're trying to solve a different problem. And so aligning on core problems and principles is number one. The second thing that I've learned is, especially in relationships, I used to um, not, not blame the other person, but indicate where they were wrong in a very positive way. So you all know like the kiss and punch strategy, right? Where you compliment someone and then you like kick them in the knee. So you'd be like, you're really smart. However, you also suck. So that's actually not the way you give feedback to people. So I've learned that the better way to do it is twofold. Number one is you share how actions in general are actually impacting you. So when this happens, 
Not when you do this. When this happens, I feel this way or this does this thing. The second way to give smart people feedback is instead of telling them what to do. So someone goes to you with a problem and says like, someone cheated on me or whatever, whatever. Instead of saying, well, you should do this, say, well, when this happened to me or something like this happened to me, here's what I did. And intelligent people with big ass egos will then be smart enough to infer for their own lives what they should adapt. Um, so that's number two. Uh, number three. Oh, no, 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 no. Ah, okay, great. Um, so when you're young, I think a lot of people talk about work-life balance, especially the lazy Gen Zers. Uh, but... Um, uh, which if you're high functioning, we all know there's no such thing as 50-50. It's 100 and 100 on any given day. Um, but that's okay. Um, and I think it's okay for you to devote your life to work in the early days. Uh, I think something that I lamented when I was in big corporate at YouTube, as much as I love the experience, is there were doers and then there were talkers. And I would often lament that the loudest voice in the room would often be right and get the most credit, even if they didn't do the work. And I complained a lot to my boss about this because this just felt unfair. And so... Um, I think what I, the, the best guidance that I was given from him, his name is Chris Hamilton, uh, sort of a true legend of a boss, probably my best boss I've ever had, um, was just put your head down and do the work and all other things will follow. But once you've done the work, if it's good enough, it will speak for itself and then you should package it. So let me break that apart. The best product is the best marketing. Said another way, the way you get awards, speeches, public notoriety is by having quality work. The second, though, of tantamount importance is you also have to make sure that you're talking about that work and packaging it in a meaningful way. Now, the sequence here is really important. A lot of charlatans will start with the marketing and packaging and not actually have a quality product. Those people don't last. Those are public LinkedIn influencer warriors. You do not want to be that. That will catch up with you so fast, much faster than you think. So that's number one, product comes first. The second is, well, what codifies a, a meaningful product? And of course, this could be a fund, a program, a campaign, whatever have you. Uh, you want to make sure, of course, you have two dimensions. You have steak and then, of course, sizzle. So steak has to be something that is numerically, measurably impactful in the space that you occupy. Sizzle is the je ne sais quoi, heuristic, anecdotal, does this make me excited and look like something distinct? You always need to have both, but the more important thing is you need to have them in that sequence or that order. Um, so that's the next thing I wish I, I, I knew uh, earlier. Um, the other thing I would say is um, I continue to be, for the most part, the youngest, dumbest, least experienced, and least liquid or wealthy person in most of the rooms I occupy. Uh, this has always been true in my career, and I think it's the right way to live and operate, especially when you're relatively young. Um, uh, it's sort of like buying real estate or th you thinking of yourself as space. You want to build, you, you want to buy sort of the shittiest place in the most expensive part of the city because it up levels you. And so I remember feeling, and still to this day, an enormous imposter syndrome of why is this CEO calling me when he's about to get fired? I have no business talking to a 55 year old of a, in that case, $10 billion business. And something that was told to me early on, especially at YouTube, when we were building the creator economy, um, was, uh, even though we don't have a shared history, even though one person who you're working with may have decades on you and you only have one or two years out of college, you can't define your relationship and respect through shared history or tenure, but instead shared destiny. So there is a fundamental mutual respect, said another way, about the goal that we're trying to achieve. Many of you probably have reports who are older than you. Raise your hand if you do. How many of you, oh, keep, keep your hands up. How many of you have a report that's over a decade older than you. Exactly. So that can be really scary because these people have just been through life in ways that we have not. And as we all know, age is not a linear thing. 25 is fundamentally different from 31. It's fundamentally different from 45, despite the sort of disparate leaps and so, uh, or inclusive of the disparate leaps. And so again, aligning on where you are trying to go together is one way to disarm people and also find sort of a mutual respect. Uh, next thing. Um, this is really quick, uh, but um, basically um, everyone thinks that, uh, especially when you're younger, trying to define your own career because you haven't defined it yet. And often this is where zero sum mentality will start to propagate. You will think that your rise has to mean the diminishment of another person. Uh, I think I learned early on and was lucky by force that the best way to grow and the highest form of growth is actually generosity. The highest form of power is not who is the billionaire or the trillionaire or who wields the most, but who is able to share and give away without any regard of their own expense the most. That is the most important lesson you can learn about power. Power is given and shared, not taken.
And the way I learned this at YouTube was I was 22. There's this thing called partners and no one gave a shit about all these partners named Ryan Higa, and Michelle Fawn and so forth were on the plot. The Fung Brothers was how we met. Um, uh, no, one, no one cared at all because everyone wanted to be Netflix and HBO where you license a bunch of traditional media content and parlay that as a Trojan horse into originals. But there were a few of us who really believed in this, that the democratization of creation of content was a powerful and necessary thing, especially for traditionally marginalized folks on media. Unfortunately, no one cared. And so we had to walk around to 55 different teams, 55 different leads who were all two decades older with Harvard or MBAs, literally half of them because it was Google. And we had to, number one, understand what their intrinsic goals were because they didn't care about ours. Once we understood what theirs were, we then found a way to influence them by propagating their own goals and then propagating ours. Fast forward five years, we built a multi-billion dollar business that the world now knows is the creator economy. And so I, by force, had to understand how do you positively influence others by helping them help you. And so again, my lesson here is as you're growing, especially in your 20s, I don't know how many of you are still in your 20s. How many of you are in your 20s? Oh, okay. How many of you are in your 30s? All right, this is especially true for you. So most of you in your 30s are either founders or your mid-level management, which is the worst place to be because you have to do because you have to do just enough to get promoted but not too much to get fired, right? It's impossible. And this is also where the bamboo ceiling really hits you. And so my lesson to you is one of the best ways to grow, one of the best ways to indicate that you're a great leader is to become a leader without direct reports. And this comes through generosity of how you can align with other people's goals and realize them. Um, next. Okay, great. Forgetting that everyone is a war. One of the greatest forms of empathy, uh, forms or lessons of empathy um, that I think I gained um, in the last decade is understanding that everyone has a secret war that they're dealing with they, they will not tell you. And often the tougher the person, the more egregious it is. I'll give a specific example I have a privilege to share. How many of you know Dave Liu, L-I-U, who was, uh, don't raise your hand yet, there's like four that are well known. Um, so, <laughs> but only two of them that we really love. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> Totally good. I'm totally joking. I'm not joking. Uh, all right, anyway. So, um, so uh, he's the one with the mustache, the Super Mario mustache. Some of you may not know it. So he founded the TMT practice at Jeffrey's Bank uh, during the 2000s. Um, so it became incredibly liquid on the investment banking side. He then founded and became a chairman of a company called Bowers Wilkins. It was a luxury sort of speaker company. And he is now a multi-time investor. Most recently, we were both investors in a film called DD uh, that I heard someone is leading PR for uh, that won the top prize at Sundance. He is, without question, one of the most generous, sincere, no bullshit people I've ever met. And what I didn't realize was, well, and he has a signature Super Mario mustache, if you've ever seen him, which is odd because he's Asian. Um, and, and what I didn't realize is the re partly the reason he has a mustache is because he was born with four cleft palates. And he was, when he was a child, he was called Monster. He was called Elephant Boy. He literally had zero friends in school and would go back to his mother and cry constantly. And she would always remind him, David, but your father and I love you. And you need to not give a shit about anyone else and literally use that language when he was seven. Fast forward, while some hurt people hurt people, Dave took that loneliness as a power and responsibility to give others permission to make them feel safe. And so now you have one of the most generous and sincere, incredible father and husband, beloved human beings in Dave Liu. And so the message here is that everyone is at war right before your very eyes in the case of a Super Mario mustache. And so to remember that if someone is treating you poorly, it's probably because they are going through hell. Now, that doesn't mean you need to go ask them, why are you going through hell? How can I help? Um, sometimes, if you're me, that is your place, and you will do that because you're obnoxious and have no filter. Um, but you don't always, it's not always your responsibility to solve everyone's problems. But remembering this can create an incredible form of shared humanity. Uh, I'm going to fly through the rest because they want to do Q&A, apparently. Um, OK. Um, uh, I'll use my YouTube experience early days. So, um, so I was the fastest promoted, most awarded person under the age of 30 at YouTube. And suddenly when I turned 26 and my efforts brought in $1.5 billion, which was roughly 40% of top line revenue, I started to have a lot of internal haters. And I was very confused by this because I also was the most awarded peer person, so theoretically the most loved, and killing it. And I, I asked a bunch of my friends, why does, and I, I'll, I'll, I could name them if you wanted, but I was like, why does this person not like me? I've literally never talked to them. They don't know me. And the, the best guidance I was given from them, this is the CEO of YouTube at the time, was being it's because you manifest their insecurities. 
And I learned this lesson that if you are doing great work and as good of a person as you can be, 99% of the backlash against you will come from people who are uninformed or envious. Again, if you are doing great work and a good person who is as generous as possible, the overwhelming majority of backlash you get will be from people who are uninformed or envious. They do not have access to you and therefore to create agency in their own life, they need to adopt some perspective of you. The other important note is, I used to call it the Kanye effect, though he's entirely problematic in my opinion now. Um, but back when he was like only half problematic, uh, we would say that if you do anything novel, half of people will hate you for it. Now, why is this? Humans are very binary. We have Republicans, we have Democrats, we have Coke, we have Pepsi, we have day and night. So if you do anything, you are likely coming from one side, regardless of how centrist you believe yourself to be. And so you will naturally piss off half of people. So whenever I go into anything, or whenever we launch anything, I tell the team, I assume half of the people are not gonna think this is hot, and that's winning. And let me give you a data point on this. There's an incredible book called Dataclism written by one of the founders of OkCupid. It's about now a decade outdated, but a lot of the lessons are perennial. And one of the most salient lessons from a decade's worth at the time of aggregate data was the people on OkCupid who actually got the highest engagement, messaging and so forth, were not actually the hottest people or the most attractive people who got the equivalent of five out of five stars. They were the people who got three out of five stars. Now, this sounds really unintuitive, especially to a room full of fellow goals, because three stars out of five is failing. That's a C. Uh, but in reality, it's because they were immensely polarizing. Half of the people gave them one stars and didn't find them attractive at all. The other half gave them five because they were resoundingly attractive. This is the type of artist, this is the type of founder you want to be. If you are pleasing everyone, you're probably a prostitute, as my mother would say. Your job is to change things. If you are scared about ruffling feathers, then you should be prepared for a stable, calm, and in the eyes of history, I'm, I, I, this is going to be loaded, I'll get in trouble, but a, a, very, a very normal life, as it were, and not a new life, and that's okay. Many of us have our own priorities, obligations, and want that comfort, you want low blood pressure, that's all great, but if you're at this conference, you probably are not one of those people, and so just be prepared to piss off the right people. Uh, next. Uh, this is pretty obvious, but um, the secret is that at some point, even the people who hate you will love you because you have secretly given them permission. The only lesson I wanted to learn here is I think we all deal with FOMO to an extent. Why was I not invited to that? Why was I not invited to this? Blah, 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 blah. The trick to having FOMO is to create it. You should not want to beg to be invited to something. You should create the thing that you wanted to be invited to. The way I look at this at Gold House is the Met Gala is the most watched by absolute viewers event on the continent. Therefore, it is the most important cultural institute or event in my mind. I would love to go to the Met Gala. It's been offered. It would be amazing. But why not just build your own Met Gala? Why not just have the new form of the most aspirational event period that convenes people? So trying to change your psyche on this and build your house as opposed to requesting an invite to someone else's is another important piece here uh, as well. Uh, next thing. Um, so uh, I think we all know that friends and relationships and community really matter. Let me punctuate how egregious this is. Uh, the Surgeon General has indicated that loneliness is now the single greatest cause of death that is unspoken within society. Um, uh, Lydia Denwood, Denford uh, actually quantified this and said that most of our closest friends come from either work or school, and increasingly just school because of distributed work. Because when you meet someone, you on average need 80 con uh, hours with them within the first three months to become close friends, and 200 hours spent with them within the first 90 days to become best friends. How many of you have spent 80 hours with someone after meeting them for the first time in the first three months? None of you. Exactly. This is impossible. It doesn't matter if you're part of a soccer league or like an improv class. That does not amount to 80 hours. We're all too busy. And so finding and going deeper and building ritualisms, whether through the church or whether through game night and so forth, is increasingly important on this. Um, Probably pretty obvious to you all. Um, the way that I like to think about sort of relationships and community is what serves your head, what serves your heart, and what serves your hand. Uh, and I'll give an employee example of this in a moment. Um, many of you probably know your soul is actually not your heart. Your soul is up in your brain. You all know this, right? All right. Your soul is your brain, by the way. Okay. 
Maybe no one knows. Maybe none of you believe in the soul. All right. So, so your soul is your brain. Um, your heart is sort of like who sings and who do you trust most. And then your hands are what works in productivity. So the way I like to think about this is you need a set of organizations or relationships that sate each of these three faculties of you. So I'll give you a uh, more recent example. One of our employees who runs the operations of our fund is named Oscar, uh, who's really incredible. Um, uh, really, it also comes from Google, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, you all know and love Oscar. Ozzy's the best. And so... Um, We've set up Oscar in sort of three ways right now. So for his hands, he just got admitted to Milken's uh, Young Leader Circle, which is basically all the top young VCs, PE firms, and so forth. It's great for him to understand how he can increase his own mission at a practical level of financial literacy and accessibility. So that's his work group. His brain or soul group is something called Summit. Summit is sort of like the young creative intelligentsia group uh, where basically, honestly, people get really high and like do 6 a.m. dance parties. Um, but it's really beautiful because it's the Burning Man crew and everyone sort of like, you know, collaborates in, in, in sort of cool, personal, spiritual ways. So that satisfies his soul. And then his heart, Oscar is just amazing and having a lot of really close friends and a lot of best friends. And so again, when you think about sort of the multitudes of your relationship, I like to think about it in this trinity of are you sating each one? Obviously, you can't over-index in each one all the time, but having uh, options in each of them as often as possible is really important. Um, next. Uh, I'll fly through this too. Um, we all know why giving is important. Uh, we all know why health is important. And then the final thing is um, then we die. Uh, so, uh, so the most important lesson on dying that I've learned, um, because I watched my father pass away when I was 15, is, is twofold. Number one is, uh, I used to think that I could fix everything because I'm very productive and resourceful and optimistic and so forth. There is a great wisdom in knowing what you have no control over fixing, including and especially mortality. And I think as a founder, sometimes you want to push, push, push because you have all this pressure and all this capital and so forth. Sometimes the wisest and strongest thing is to let it go. Um, the other uh, lesson of this, and this is, I think, particularly true in romantic relationships uh, and or personal relationships, is often those of us who are productive and optimistic and resilient want to hold on to relationships that may, we have may, uh, may have outgrown. And so something that was told to me once that, that I've never forgotten is what must happen, what happens, excuse me, inevitably should happen immediately. It is easier to cut things off or more important to cut things off early than it is to let them fatigue. I think we've all been in a relationship that honestly lasted a year, multiple months longer than it should have. What must happen inevitably should happen immediately in your own life. Um, anyway, that's all I had. Um, I hope this was practically helpful. I'm sorry there were not that many inspiration stories, but we can do that now in the last seven minutes. Uh, and uh, finally, thank you to Brian and Maggie for having me, and congratulations on the incredibly diverse AHN. Uh, it is truly such a privilege to be here.